Hello, my name is Ken Kirby, and I'm a retired pastor, and I'm a member here at Matahawken Baptist Church. And we are starting a discipleship ministry here uh, in our church, and I hope that it will be helpful to you. Uh, pastor and the elders have asked me to uh, put together these uh, first four lessons on understanding your walk with God. The four lessons in this class, the first one is how to become a Christian and how to be sure that you're a Christian. And then the second lesson is once you become a Christian, we all still struggle with sin at times in our lives. We need to learn how to confess. The third lesson deals with temptation, how we resist uh, falling back into old patterns. And the fourth lesson is on the person of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit enables us to live our lives for Christ. As we begin tonight in this first lesson, Understanding Your Walk with God, I'd like to try to get a, a focus on what does it mean to be a Christian? First of all, there are two days in our lives that, over which you and I have absolutely no control whatsoever. The first day is my birthday. I didn't have anything to say about that, neither did you. And then we have the culmination of our lives, or my death day. During this period, we have four basic questions we really need to answer and figure out. Where did I come from? Where did I come from? Who am I after all? Why am I here? And where am I going when I leave this place which we call planet Earth? Most people have come to the conclusion that the only way to find a life is to write your own story. Uh, I decide what I want to accomplish with my life. I decide uh, whether I want to get rich or whether I want to become famous or whatever. But that's between these two points, my birthday and my death day. There is no answer to be found within ourselves. We need an answer from God as to who we are and why we're here and where we're going when we depart. And as we begin this evening, I'm going to be opening a chapter of the Bible where Jesus is speaking with a man by the name of Nicodemus and explaining to him the great need of salvation. In order to understand it, we have to go all the way back to the, the beginning of the Bible and the opening page of the Bible, and it opens with this. God created. God created. That's where it all starts. We're only three pages into the Bible when Adam, the first man who was created, thought he knew more than God. God had warned Adam, don't rebel against me. I, I'm telling you, this is how you find life, Adam. You know what Adam said to God? Thank you very much for creating me. You may leave now. I can handle it from here. I can take care of my own life, run my own show, write my own story. And from that moment on, God had warned Adam that in the day you rebel, you shall surely die. It's interesting, the original text there says something like this. He doesn't say, Adam, this is the day that you disobey me, you're done. He doesn't say that. He says, in essence, you will begin to die, and one day your life will end. And then you will give an account of your life. It's sort of like this. I've used this illustration a thousand times. Can you imagine a motor that is plugged into the wall? It's running because of the power that's coming out of that outlet. And as that motor is, can we say, personified, and the motor says, I don't like being tied down to this cord. And the motor says, I'm going to run on my own and pulls the cord. The motor doesn't stop immediately, does it? It runs for a little while until finally the life runs out of it. You see, the whole message of the Bible is, how do we get our lives back? Because we are all born in this condition of Adam. Tonight, we're going to understand how we get our lives back through the work of Jesus Christ. Let me begin by reading for you John 3, 1 to 8. Now, it was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, 
he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Let's just take a little bit here and think through this text. First of all, Nicodemus has an opinion about Jesus. He said, Jesus, you're a great teacher from God. Maybe you're like one of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, and I know that you're a miracle worker that confirms you're this very special person. He says, but I'm telling you, until you are born again, you will not see the kingdom, nor will you enter the kingdom of God, even though you think right now that you're fine with God. So let's begin by, by looking together at a, a little diagram to explain uh, carefully here who Jesus uh, is in Nicodemus's mind. Nicodemus has a faith, that is, what he believes, who he believes Jesus to be. And that person is a teacher sent from God and a miracle worker. But notice carefully here, Nicodemus sees Jesus to be a co-equal man. As we think this through, we begin to realize that Nicodemus has a high opinion of Jesus, but Jesus isn't impressed by his compliments. <laughs> he doesn't say, hey, you got that right, thank you. He doesn't even respond. He simply says, Nicodemus, until you're born again, you can't see the kingdom and you can't enter the kingdom of God. By this time, Nicodemus is thoroughly confused. And I want to use a diagram to explain to you why he's confused and what Jesus is saying to him. So here we are on planet Earth with Jesus and Nicodemus speaking. He thinks he's a teacher from God, co-equal. And he says to Nicodemus, you can't even see the kingdom. Now this was a man who knew the Old Testament inside out. He knew more about God than probably anybody you'd ever meet in the present world where Jesus meets him. He knows a lot about God, but he doesn't know God. You see, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is a spiritual world. Friends, this is only one half of reality, this place we call our natural world where we're writing our story, where this brief few moments that we have here does not explain who I really am. And so Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, in the kingdom of heaven where God is, and we realize from the study of Scripture that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he says to Nicodemus, until you understand who God is and who you are and how you come to know God, you can't even see God because you only have eyes to see this world. It's interesting as we read the Bible, the Scripture says that people in this condition are blind. They're deaf. They're lost. They're condemned. They're living only in half of reality. And that half of reality only lives for a few years. But Jesus is saying, I want to teach you about the kingdom of God and eternal life that begins when you come to know who I am. As we think this through, and we understand what Jesus is saying, he says, why must I be born again? Because I'm dead. <laughs> because I have no spirit alive in me that can even know or see God. I need to have a new birth because this person of the Holy Spirit needs to do a work in me, just as like in Nicodemus, in order for me to really know who God is. It's from this point on that Jesus goes to tell Nicodemus about his real problem with God that he doesn't even know he has. You see, Nicodemus thinks he's a great guy. He thinks he's a good person. He is a keeper of the law and the Ten Commandments. Did you ever notice the Ten Commandments carefully? Almost every one of them says, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. 
Really? You see, Nicodemus defined his righteousness by the things that he did not do. But Jesus came to change us into people who do what God asked us to do, to really be righteous people. So at this point, we move on with the text to realize what Jesus says to him. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered, Are you the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak what we know and bear witness of what we have seen, but you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And do you see what happened here? He says to Nicodemus, oh, you know the scriptures, man. You know the Old Testament inside and out. There's something you missed. The Old Testament predicted that the Messiah, the Son of God, was going to come into this world. He predicted that the Spirit of God was going to come and cause new birth in the lives of people who put their faith in him. And then he says something fascinating. He says, we've been telling you this. We've been talking to you. And you're not listening. I always scratch my head. He goes, what do you mean we? It was just Nicodemus and Jesus. And all of a sudden I thought to myself, oh, here's what he's saying. He's saying, my father's speaking to you right now, Nicodemus, as I speak to you. And the Spirit of God's speaking to you. And you're going, wait a minute. No, no, no. I don't want to hear this stuff. I don't need anything more. I'm fine with God. And Jesus said, I want to tell you, you don't see the kingdom yet, and you certainly won't enter it. And then he says two amazing things. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven. He said, Nicodemus, no human being has ever gone up to heaven, taken a video camera, taken some shots to see what heaven's really like, and come down. Because every person who had a vision of God in the Old Testament, fell on their face in the holy presence of God, believing that they were going to melt or, or be condemned, that they weren't going to live. But he says, Nicodemus, the problem here is you have to understand who I am. I am not like you. I descended from heaven. I have always been in heaven with my Father. We created this world together. We created you. He's not ready for all this truth yet. But the point is, he's saying, I came down from heaven. And then he calls himself the Son of Man. Friends, if there's one, one phrase you need to understand in the Gospels above anything else is this term. You know how many times it's used in the Gospels? The Son of Man? Over 80 times. It is a reference that Jesus refers to himself as being the Son of Man. Real quick, in order to understand it, and this guy would have known what he was talking about. The Son of Man comes out of the book of Daniel, chapter 7. It's a scene where Daniel is permitted to see the end of the world and, and the final judgment, and the, and the court is set up, it says in this book, and the judge is ready to judge, and the books are open, and everybody's record is brought, and everybody's going to give an account of themselves. It's a scary adventure, friend. And he says, but into this courtroom someone comes, and Daniel, speaking to the angel, says, Who is this? He looks like the Son of Man. He looks human. And they march him to the front of the courtroom, and he is crowned the king. And Jesus is saying, That would be me. It's fascinating because when you read the four Gospels, Jesus makes a statement that's really shaky, shaky to the core. He says, My Father will judge no one. All judgment has been given unto me. And what he is saying here is that I am that person that Daniel predicted before whom every human being will give an account of himself or herself. I am the final judge of everything. This man is rocked. <laughs> Believe me, he is rocked by this statement. It is his claim to be the Messiah and the Son of God. And then secondly, he says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, 
even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He's referring to something this man would have known. It was during the Exodus when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt. They had been miraculously delivered through the Red Sea. They're complaining and griping and whatever. They're just angry with God and angry at Moses. And so as part of the punishment, they're being bitten by snakes and they're dying like flies. And they appeal to Moses. Moses, please pray to God. It's our fault. Please help. And God speaks to Moses and he says, Moses, I want you to take a wooden pole. And I want you to fashion a bronze serpent, and I want you to put it on the pole. And I want you to put it in the ground, and you tell all those people who have been bitten by snakes, just look, just look at what I provided, and you will be healed. And many of them were. And some of them were too stubborn to even do that. <laughs> you remember, a lot of people think that uh, that, that symbol, have you ever seen the symbol in the medical field of this idea with the serpent, that it probably came from that event. But here's what he's saying. is Moses took a serpent and put it on a pole. Even so, I will be lifted up on a pole. And he is predicting, of course, his crucifixion. And he will die for the sin of the world. He will become the Lamb of God. Nicodemus isn't going to get this yet. Let's move on. Let me show you a little diagram and maybe make this clear. Here's what's happened so far. Nicodemus has said to Jesus, I think you're a teacher sent from God, a miracle worker. Jesus said to him, you're blind, you can't see the kingdom, and you have no hope of entering it unless the Holy Spirit causes a new birth in you. And so Jesus clearly says to Nicodemus, I am not like you. I am the eternal Son of God, who was born supernaturally into this world to come to die on a cross. And Nicodemus, I'm going to die on a cross, but I want you to know, real quick, let me go back here once. I want you to know that I am not a teacher sent from God and just a miracle worker, and I certainly am not. There used to be an equal sign here, co-equal with you. But rather, I am the Son of God who will die on a cross, be buried for three days, and resurrected and returned to heaven, and be crowned the King, the Son of Man, okay, that was predicted by Daniel. And in my first coming down here to this planet, I am offering you the opportunity for me to bring you home to the Father. But be sure of this, Nicodemus, that I am coming a second time to judge the world, and I will fulfill everything that was given in Daniel chapter 7. By this time, his head is spinning. He is wondering, who am I talking to here? Could it be that this is truly the Son of God? Is this truly the one who was sent to be the Lamb of God to die on a cross for our sins? He doesn't say another word. He's too stunned. And so Jesus goes on at this point. To do something rather fascinating. He says, Nicodemus, I came down to be lifted up on a cross to die for the forgiveness of your sin and to give you eternal life. But I want you to know why. Now notice this carefully. The verse 4. I came down from heaven to be lifted up on a cross because, here's the reason, God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. If that weren't enough, he says, secondly, second reason, for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And then he goes on one more time, and he says that, that men were not seeking God because Anyone who does evil does not come to the light, but runs away from the light. And so we have these three reasons for why Christ came down to this earth and why Christ died on the cross. Because of my Father and I still love you. We certainly don't want to condemn you. And none of you were seeking for us because you were running away in fear of your condemnation. So my Father sent me to chase you down. What an amazing thing. 
Friends, I cannot rebirth myself. Uh, a lot of people talk about being born again, of reinventing yourself. That's nothing more than making a few adjustments to your story that's still going to end. <laughs> rebirth is when the Spirit of God shows me my sin, shows me who Jesus is. I put my faith in Christ and I repent of my sin and Christ's Spirit comes to live in me. And friends, I'm no longer me. My story ends. Thank you. My story ends. And his story begins in my life. I am no longer me. I am me in Christ and Christ in me. My life is now defined not by that birthday to death day experience because he forgave me of my sin and my death day is gone. And my judgment is gone. And I spend the rest of my life getting to know Jesus and rejoicing and living in thanksgiving and praise for what he did for me at his cross and through his resurrection. That just as he died, I died with him. Just as he was risen, I was risen with him. Just as he ascended back to heaven, I am in heaven for sure, even right now, just waiting to go home when this short little term of my life ends. One last thing that I'd like to show you as we uh, continue. Everyone is born on planet Earth looking like this. As we look at this little diagram here, you see there's a, here's a circle, and here is a chair. We're going to use that to represent the throne, that is, who's running the show. Christ is outside the life. The Holy Spirit is seeking to tell me that I need Jesus. I'm running my story. I'm running my show. And quite frankly, friends, if you and I get honest, we're not very impressive. <laughs> we're, not, we're not all we crack ourselves up to be. We're lost. We're blind. We need forgiveness for living this way. So when I repent of my sin and I admit I need forgiveness and I put my faith in Christ, I stop thinking that I could do what God wants me to do in my own strength. And I pray and I receive Christ into my life. And self is dethroned and I begin to, to want to yield myself to Christ. That is how I am born again. That is when the Holy Spirit changes me. You know, I can't give you a formula. This is how you're born again. But I can tell you this is how you meet Jesus so that the Holy Spirit can rebirth you. And that is to repent and to believe in Christ. So this is who I become. But then from that moment on, I am to live, to yield my life to Christ and to, and to learn to walk with him. But the fact of the matter is, I can still be tempted to go back to sin. And when I do, and, and incidentally, may I say here clearly, that you and I have never given Jesus any surprise with anything we've done since we've met him. Not one moment. He knows what he bought at the cross. And he knows who I am when I'm born again. I can fall into sin. And the Spirit of God will tell me, you should not have dethroned Jesus. And then the Spirit of God provides for us repentance over this sin. Simple admission and agreement to get back here to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to be struggling with this until we go home. So let's look at these three circles together as we conclude this lesson. I'm born this way. I'm writing my story. I'm trying to be impressive to myself and to others, and, and I'm trying to convince myself that I'm good enough for God. But the fact is, I'm not. That is why Christ had to come and die and offer me the forgiveness which he alone can give me. And when I receive Christ, now listen to this. I, I, I can't do it here, but I could draw a nice big X here and say, He dies. I will never be alone again. Now, I may struggle at times of being in perfect fellowship with him and falling into sin, but I am still in Christ. I'm in Christ here, and I'm in Christ here. And the more I learn to give thanks and praise to him, the more I see God changing me and making me like Christ himself. One final word of caution. 
please understand that God wants to forgive you and forgive me. God wants to. So much so that he sent his son for us. He just asks us to be, get real, to be honest. I was thinking the other day, there's a statement that floats around this world, and everyone probably that I've ever met agrees to it. Nobody's perfect, right? Nobody's perfect. And so you know what we do as human beings, we say, well, nobody's perfect, so God's going to accept everybody. Wrong. Wrong. There was one person who was perfect. The eternal Son of God lived a perfect, sinless life. And secondly, God only accepts perfect people into his eternally perfect kingdom. There's no way that you or I could meet the standard of God. And so Christ comes down from heaven, takes on a human body, lives a perfectly sinless life, and says to me, if you will admit your sin to me, I will give you my life. I will give you my righteousness. You know what that means? Christ says, my Father and I will give you credit for the way I lived. And I will take responsibility for the way you lived and go to the cross so that your death sentence will be removed. The real message of the gospel, my friends, is this. That Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the eternal judge, chose to become my Savior. He is not a God who says God helps those who help themselves. Jesus is the Son of God who says, I have come to help you because you cannot help yourself. And for you and I who have put our faith in Christ, we have the greatest help that could ever be given, the total forgiveness of our sin, all fear of God, all judgment gone, and we live our lives from the moment that we're born again in thanksgiving and praise and joy. We should be dancing our way all the way home. Oh, someone may ask, what happened to this guy? Nothing here. Later, when Jesus is put on the cross, crucified, and his dead body is hanging on the cross, this man with another man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea came and took down the body of Jesus, extracting the nails, carrying his body to the tomb of Joseph. I believe at that moment, the Spirit of God put the pieces together, and he understood that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I encourage you, as I close this lesson, to be sure that you have received Christ, and if you have, be sure you know what you have in him. Be sure you know that you have been forgiven, that the joy of the Lord is yours. And if you haven't, all you need to do is to pray to the Lord honestly and receive him by faith. May the Lord bless you until we get together next week. Thank you.